Hey folks, Joe Valley here. Welcome to another episode of the Quiet Light Podcast. Today's guest is a, uh, a friend of mine. He's a friend of a lot of yours. His name is Steve Chu. Uh, very, very successful entrepreneur. I'm one of the good guys. He's a good human. There's, there's uh, only a handful of them in the world these days, and, and Steve's one of them. Um, he is running two seven-figure businesses. He's working 20 hours a week. He's got a YouTube channel. He's just doing incredible stuff. Podcast, all sorts of things that, uh, you know, put most of us to shame in terms of the lack of stress that he has and the financial well-being that he has um, and, and the time that he gets to spend with his family. Uh, every afternoon uh, is with his kids. Um, so he's working about, you know, four hours a day running two seven-figure businesses, uh, including, you know, a, a podcast and uh, an event that he does once a year, Seller Summit down in uh, in Florida in May every year. Um, he He's taken, you know, uh, something else off of his bucket list, which was to, to publish a book. And it's called The Family First Entrepreneur. And what we talk about in the, in, in the podcast here is all about the things that you, me, he, we can and should do as entrepreneurs to level things out and um, make sure that we're happy first as, as, as families, as entrepreneurs with families and, and being successful entrepreneurs as well. Um, you've heard me talk about it over the years, right? You know, with the life as an entrepreneur, uh, myself since 1997, there's, there's amazing years, uh, but there's also really painful, you know, days, weeks, and months uh, that are hard to get through and around. Um, when you apply the principles that Steve talks about in his new book, it levels those things out, I think, right? So, it, you know, one of the concepts is just simply paying yourself first, figuring out what your annual expenses are and making sure that the business is paying you that and paying yourself first. Everything else is gravy. It's just smart. After, you know, a couple of decades in the business, I began doing that. If you're one or two years in, I think you got to do that. Steve lays it all out. What he does here also, though, really, really, sm it's part of you know him as a incredible marketer. He's not just selling a book. If you if you buy the book, you're also getting uh, a whole bunch of free bonuses. You know, three hours of training on YouTube and things of the, there, I, there's so many I, I can't even list them all. But it's it's many, many hours of free courses and training that Steve Chu himself does that's going to help you grow your e-commerce business, your content business, or uh, whatever type of business you're running. These free bonuses, he says, will 20, you'll get 20x the value of, of the purchase of the book. I think it's more like 200 or 2,000x. You really do the math. Um, it, it's just an incredible process to marketing a book, which is part of being a very successful entrepreneur. The book itself, again, is called The Family First Entrepreneur. It's a mouthful. Thefamilyfirstentrepreneur.com. Uh, but let's let's jump to it. Talk to Steve. Get his take on life as an entrepreneur, what his approach is. He's giving some tips about YouTube at the end on uh, how to produce videos, uh, all sorts of different things throughout the, the, the podcast here. So it's a long one, right? We, we probably talked for 45 minutes. So take a listen. Put us on two times speed if you need to, but definitely listen to it. Absorb it. Steve's a really good human, great entrepreneur, and doing it well as a, as a father of two as well. Here we go. Steve Chu, welcome. I think welcome back to the Quiet Light Podcast. You've been on before, right? I think I've been on before, but always happy to be back, Joe. Thanks for having me. I missed you at uh, ECF this year, right? Were you in San Diego? I, know. I was. It was a great event. And uh, rumor has it that you're dialing back a little bit, relaxing a little more. Is that I'm, I'm getting case? old, man. Look at the gray on my chin. Come on. It's obvious, <laughs> isn't it? You're not that old. Are you much older than me? I don't think so. I'm 57. I doubt it. I'm 57. Okay. All right. I take that back. You're a lot older than me. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, man. It's, both my kids are, are uh, off to college now, right? I, I, so my wife and I are empty nesters. So it's, it's a good time for me to just pull the throttle back a little bit. Um, not, not completely, but a little bit anyway, so that uh, we've got more time together now that the kids are out. It's funny is I would have the opposite attitude. I'm actually waiting for, to be an empty nester so I can actually start my next business, but I'm not doing it right now because the kids. You're going to be old and tired like I am by the time they graduate. You think how, so? How old are your kids? 13 and 15. How old are you now? 
I am 48 this year. All right. Yeah. So, well, 13. No, you won't be quite as old as me, but um, yeah, you might, you might. We'll see. Let's, let's talk when, when they're gone. Right. All right. Sounds good. Sounds yeah. good. So you were in San Diego. I think Walker attended the ECF. No, I sat next to Walker at dinner. Talked All right. to him the whole night, in fact. Did he talk yeah. about the fact that he's a published author and a Wall Street Journal bestselling author, and you are now about to be a Wall Street <laughs> Journal bestselling author? Nah, Walker's not the type to talk about those things. Yes. Yes. Uh, <laughs> yes. No, he, <laughs> he no, always he gave me the run. He, I have to say, <laughs> I have to say, I'm no Walker Dybul. Anytime I talk about my book, I say, but I'm no Walker Dybul. It's the deal I have because he's a Wall Street Journal bestseller. I'm just something. Else. <laughs> That's what I'm going for too. But he was actually very helpful in telling me what he did to get there. So yeah, we had a good conversation. I appreciated he, it. He worked his ass off. Writing the book is very hard. Editing it because you've got to read it because it's your book. You've got to look at all the details and make sure your voice is there. That's very hard and time consuming, especially if you put in tables and charts or anything like that, like mine. Um, but then the promotion of the book, you like the podcast tour that you're doing now um, and, and beyond. So but let's, let's talk about this book that you've written, um, family, mm -hmm. The Family First Entrepreneur. Yep, that's what it's called. Uh, it's How to Achieve Financial Freedom Without Sacrificing What Matters Most. Now, Joe, you, you and I, we've known each other for a long time. I run two seven-figure businesses and I work 20 hours a week. And I do that kind of out of necessity because, I mean, you're an empty nester now, but my entire afternoon is literally occupied driving my kids to activities, coaching, helping them with their homework, uh, going to Russian math, which you, Darian, teases me nonstop. But, you know, taking care of kids is a lot of work if you want to do a good job at it. Oh, it's so. incredibly hard work if you want to do a good job at it, like you say. So two seven-figure businesses and you're working 20 hours a week. That's why I think you can see putting the throttle down and growing the business in five more years when your youngest is off to college, right? You're yeah. not, see, I, I, I hate the term, but I feel like I've been grinding it out for a decade at Quiet Light. And that's why I just got to pull the throttle back a little bit. You, on the yeah. other hand, um, are really balancing things really well. Now, look, I've not been an absentee father. I drove my kids to school every day. I was there for every sporting event. I didn't spend every afternoon with them. Because uh, they were actually, you know, off doing things with friends and in school and things of that nature. Um, but every sporting event, um, driving them to school, um, dinners every night. But still, as an entrepreneur, um, and people listening that are entrepreneurs that are busy can probably relate to this. And I want to know if you can too. I think that I'm guilty of not always being present because as an entrepreneur, mm -hmm. things are constantly on my mind. How how did you deal with that, and how do you deal with that as an entrepreneur and somebody who's really focused on family? I mean, it was a learning experience. In fact, I was caught on the Dumbo ride checking my emails uh, when we went to Disney World a while back. Uh, and then by who I who was caught, who caught you? What? And and did do you had did you have a bruise afterwards, or was it a kid? So my wife took a shot of me looking at my phone, and I've actually used that in presentations. Uh, it was bad early on because we all have egos, right, Joe? We want to start the next big thing. And at the same time, we want to balance family. And I don't, have you heard of the four burners theory before? I have through through okay. you and Jackness actually on your podcast. Yes, yeah. So the four burners theory, just in case your audience doesn't know, states that you have four burners: family, work, friends, and health. And in order to do any one thing well, you actually have to turn off one of the burners. And if you want to do something extremely well, you have to turn off two, which basically means that you just need to prioritize, right? So you're what you talked about being present. That happened to me all the time because I was trying to, uh, my ego in the beginning, when that Dumbo ride thing happened, I was trying to hit a million dollars because that was my goal. And for some reason, I felt like just hitting that number would instantly make everything better in terms of the eyes of my friends, my ego and everything. But what I didn't realize was happening, uh, you know, besides checking email and not being present was, you know, my relationship with my wife wasn't doing so well because we were fighting all the time. We hit a revenue goal. We finally hit seven figures that year. My kids were younger. And then I'd move the goalposts, hmm. right? We'd celebrate Guilty. You know, for a day, move the goalposts, and it just kept going on year after year until finally my wife sat me down and said, hey, we make like 10 to 15x more than we spend every year. We're, we're pretty frugal people. 
Like I don't drive like a nice car or anything. We have a decent house, but why are we killing ourselves to make money? Just so I could just tell my buddies that I run a seven figure business or I'm going for an eight figure business. That's just dumb. And so after that talk, things changed. And how did you address the changes? Like you've, you've written about it in the book. You've lived this. You are the example of family first as an entrepreneur. Uh, how do you convey that in the book? What kind of tips are you uh, giving to folks like me that I could have had, you know, 10 years ago as I started out this journey at Quiet Light, this all-consuming yeah. journey at Quiet Light? I'll tell you a couple of things that I did, but first things first, we dropped all revenue goals and we basically wrote down in a document, like literally a physical document, what our priorities were. And uh, let me just give you an example. So I used to speak at events all the time. So I said, okay, I'm not going to speak at no more than like six events a year. And if there's an opportunity that comes up, we actually weigh it against what I would be missing and whether it's worth it. And the more numbers that you can use in this document, the better to quantify all this stuff. I like first that you're saying we, because it was you and your wife having this discussion. It wasn't Steve, the entrepreneur, trying to figure out how to dial it back. It was both of you sitting down and going through it together. Absolutely. And usually what will happen, I, first of all, I, I don't really recommend working with your spouse in a business because it just complicates everything. I agree 100%. Um, but it just so happens, you know, my wife and I are business partners and you know, we started this business originally to hang out with family. Actually, you know what? Let's let's face it. Most people start a business not to become a billionaire. They just want the freedom to do what they want or spend time with who they want, right? Yeah. But money just always gets in the way of that. And and your ego, like trying to make more it's the, money. And, it's the ego. Yeah. It's the ego. Yeah. And in, in, in my view, I'm and it's a challenging thing, and it's not a bad thing. It's it's in my view, what has us be successful entrepreneurs in the first place. We have this, I can do that mentality. Yeah. And sometimes we fail and sometimes we succeed. Eventually we succeed and we become successful entrepreneurs. Um, I love the fact that you're having these conversations with your wife. Was it though, because you're business partners or because she's your wife and your business partner? Because, uh, you know, in my situation my my wife and I worked together back in 1997 for about a year and then that was it well for a couple of years and then that was it um and it it was great but it, it was necessary but it didn't really work it wasn't best for us in a relationship so we've been life partners since and um I'm running this business and I'd run things by her and talk and often just vent and she'd give me you know she'd be my my feedback but we never sat down and said, how much do we want to make? How many hours am I going to work? How present am I going to be? We didn't go through that exercise, but that's something you, you, you intentionally did and recommend people do. I think you got to have the conversation. It's very easy to get carried away with your next goal, right? We would have had this conversation whether she was my business partner or not because you know I was basically neglecting people and I, I was driving her nuts basically. And I was at my kids' activities, like you said, but I was, you know, on at Disneyland. I was, I was, you know, checking my emails, answering, sending out my, the next email blast, and that sort of thing. Um. So what? So what did we do? That was your original question, right? How, how do we address this? Uh, no income goals, and let, let's talk about the ego part. Uh, I got a pretty big ego in terms of, you know, excelling in certain things. Like I always want to do my best when I start a business or anything that I do. So the way I address my ego issue is I just do one thing a year, one new project a year that's related to the business. And that's what I do. And I try to do it as well as I can, but I only do one thing. So let me just give you an example. Last year was the year of YouTube. And then I grew it to 200K subs. The year before that, it was TikTok. The year before that, it was Google Ads. Uh, this year is the book. And so by just keeping my mind occupied on one thing that I just want to do well, regardless of the goal, I'm going to try my best on this one thing. And that's what fulfills my ego today. But I generally don't move on to another project until I've systematized it and made it automated in a certain way. So there's a couple of principles that I follow, which are somewhat controversial. Like my, my peers don't necessarily agree with me, but I do not like employees. If I can replace a person with a robot or some code, and I just happen to be an engineer so I can code, 
I will do so. I used to be an engineering director of microprocessor design, and I had, had a lot of people under me. And what I found was that even though these employees were fantastic at what they did, there's actually a lot of mental energy required to keep everyone happy, keep everyone motivated. And then people would ask for raises. Sometimes it'd be personal problems with other you know, coworkers and that sort of thing. And that's a lot of overhead that people don't consider. Like if you have great employees, that's great, but these mental issues will still come up, but computers will never complain. It's a mental, a mental overhead you're talking about, not necessarily dollars. Yeah. Yeah. That's correct. I agree yeah. 100%. How, you know, you're, Steve, you've been doing this since, how long have you been self-employed? What year? How, how far back? We started the store in 2007. I actually didn't quit until 2016. My wife quit in 2008. Okay. So you've been full-time for seven years, your wife, uh, you know, for much, much longer. Um, right. That's very different than a lot of the newer people that are just one or two years in to their business. I think systematizing and one new thing and trying to really, you, when you get to your stage, you're making enough money to support your family and uh, save an awful lot of money. There's right. a, a different entrepreneur that's probably in the audience or somebody that is buying a new business that, you know, is, you know, just trying to reach those goals and make ends meet as they're right. launching and starting off the business. How do you a go with the family first approach as an entrepreneur in that case. Yeah, I like to follow Mike Bakalowitz's advice, which I kind of talk about in the book, which is figure out how much you need to live, pay yourself that amount, the rest is gravy. That makes just mentally the thought of it much easier. And you're right, when you buy a business or when you haven't made it yet, you're going to work really hard. And don't get me wrong, when we first started our businesses, we actually didn't have kids and we committed ourselves to working hard. In other words, we turned off our friends burner. And I think at the time I would say we turned off our health burner too, because we weren't really eating that well. What are the other two burners that are on then? The, the friends and health. What's on now? Uh, work and... Uh, oh man, I called you out on it. Four burners. Know, yeah. Four burner theory. Come I, on, Steve. I forgot. I forgot what the fourth part was. Like, we work, friends, <laughs> Total work, friends, family, and uh, health. Work, friends, family, and health. So work and um, family. Okay, you kept you kept work and family. Um, so uh, you know, early on, obviously, you gotta you gotta have the work burner on. So you're giving that. You right. just gotta turn off something else for those people that are just starting out. Is what you're saying? Keep I think it just keep depends the on what stage of life you're on. Like if you already have kids, which actually a lot of people who listen to my podcast, they already have kids. I think you can't really turn down that family burner, right? I think for me, friends is always the first thing to go. And uh, I've come to learn over the years that you have to keep the health burner up. Mm -hmm. Because when you're in good shape, then you have a lot more energy to do a lot of those things. When you let the health slip, you know, you're lethargic. Uh, you don't have the energy to, to, to work longer hours. Yeah. You're living off of uh, Starbucks coffee, that stuff like that. How did exactly. how did the you know you, you've been a very successful entrepreneur for years now? You're very well known, big podcast conference with Seller Summit. The book itself, how did it come to fruition? The concept of it and 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 getting started. Can you just talk to about? Did you have an epiphany moment? Did somebody approach you? What what happened to make you? Uh, so the book has always been on my bucket list, but. As I was just kind of brainstorming ideas for the book, the first thing that came to mind was that all the entrepreneurship advice that I see online is wrong. And that's a, that's a strong statement. It's because most entrepreneurship advice is given by single guys who don't have any responsibilities. And they always preach that you need to work 80 hours a week, burn the midnight oil in order to succeed. And so my life, my entrepreneurship journey was not like that at all. And so the book really teaches you a way that you don't have to do that. You can actually start a business and still be present with your family. You can still run a business and do what you want to do. It just takes a little bit of discipline in order to make that happen. What are some and a of lot those, of that is quelling your ego. Yeah. Quelling the ego. It's okay. a huge one. What are, yeah, what are some of the, the tools and disciplines you share in the book? Yeah. So uh, we'd already talked about paying yourself first. Uh, okay. One thing that we don't Actually, mention. Hold on. Yeah. 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 I, I do want to address that. And I, I do want to okay. reinforce it. I've, I've been self-employed since 1997. And life as an entrepreneur with the financial ups and downs is incredibly stressful. And it wasn't until I did that, 
Steve, where I paid myself first. My wife and I figured out what we needed to live off of and we paid ourselves and everything else was gravy. It was such a Zen feeling, such peace of mind and focus and a lot less stress, which made life a lot more enjoyable. So I just want to reinforce that. I think it's a, a brilliant, brilliant idea. Like when I think of everything as gravy, that's excellent because I have no problems. And it's important actually to figure out how much you spend in a year to, to just make you make yourself happy, right? Um, just to run some numbers here, as a family, we only spend like $150,000 a year and that allows us to do whatever. So rest is gravy. I can sleep at night. That's the important thing. Okay. The other principle that I talk about is something that a lot, a lot of entrepreneurs, when they're just first starting out, don't really consider, which is profit over revenue. And let me elaborate on that a little bit. Well, this, so, goes, this is going right back to ego, right? People sit around and say, yeah, I did eight figures last year. I might have done, definitely. You know, I might have done half that with three times as much profit and I'm in a better position. So, well, I'm, I'm, just, in a master, I'm in many mastermind groups. In fact, I'm in Vegas right now recording this as part of a mastermind group. And what most people don't realize online is that a lot of these people that are really successful on podcasts and whatnot are actually kind of miserable. You know, um, they're stressed out or they're burned out. And so th there's this one guy, I won't, I won't mention his name, but he actually really pressed himself hard to hit $10 million in revenue, which is a fantastic achievement. We were all high-fiving him and everything. Yeah. But he said he's never been more miserable. And his profits actually went way down to hit that goal. So he said that he could have had like maybe, you know, one fifth of that revenue and still had that same profit without having to scale his team and without having to burn the midnight oil. And you just don't hear those stories, right? Because 10 million sounds fantastic. It's great for the ego. Um, so let me just go into what I was just about to talk about. Like one example that I like to give is uh, every, every Black Friday, I used to run a big sale, right? Because it's the thing to do. You run a big sale. It wasn't until I started running the numbers did I realize that those sales were actually losing me money. And so I had this whole different vision of, of discounting today. Let's, let's, let's throw some numbers into the mix. Let's say you sell a product for 100 bucks and your cost of goods is $50, all right? So that means you're making 50 bucks profit per unit. Let's say in a typical day, you sell 100 units. That means you're making $5,000 a day, okay? Now let's say that you're doing a 25% off sale for Black Friday. So now your new profit is 75 minus 50 is just $25 a unit. And to make that same $5,000, you now need to sell 200 units. Basically, that means that 25% discount, which you would think you only need to sell 25% more, you actually need to sell double just to break even. The things aren't linear, especially in e-commerce because you have cost of goods and you have other overhead. I was being generous at a 50% margin also. Oh yeah. Yeah. No, there's, and yeah. that's just, if that's just the cost of goods sold, it doesn't count everything else that goes into the actual cost. Yeah. Uh, I agree hundred um, percent. Profit is, you know, what is it? I, Jackness says this, right? He, uh, revenue is vanity. Oh, yeah. He's got to say yeah, that's Dave Bryant. Let's uh, let's quote the right guy, Dave Bryant, his partner. Dave, yeah, Dave, Dave. Dave's a good guy. Um, yeah, yeah Dave and I go way back. I actually knew Dave before I met Mike. Um, but it, oh. it's it's totally accurate and true. It doesn't matter how much revenue you do if your profit is you know going down because you're just trying to achieve that goal. One example in my life is before I became self-employed, I worked for a uh, direct response marketing company up in Portland, Maine. And um, the year I left, uh, we did about $102 million in revenue uh, because $100 million was the owner's goal. And that year, he lost $2 million. The year before, he did $35 million in revenue and he made $5 million. So $5 million off of $35 million, And his ego got in the way and he wanted to make nine figures in terms of revenue, but he lost $2 million in the process. Two years later, he went bankrupt. It's, it's, it's our egos that are the problem as entrepreneurs more often than not. So I, I like this approach of, of uh, you know, paying yourself first and uh, you know, cutting the revenue down and focusing on that as well. So good approach so far. What else, what else you got? What else, what else do you talk in the book, talk about in the book that I could have used 
1997 when I first started my entrepreneurial journey, Steve. I just want to mention something about what you just said about revenue. I think it just depends on the type of business you have. I used to be in the VC space and I have friends, their goal is only revenue. It doesn't matter. That's not the type of businesses we talk about in the book. A yeah. family first entrepreneur, you know, is trying to make a profit so they can stay at home and, and whatnot, just to make that clear. Okay. Yeah, and, and some revenue, some businesses eventually trade as a, a, a multiple of revenue, a SaaS company that's right. you know growing like crazy. Yeah. 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 Exceptions to um, every Okay. So the other thing is that I talk about that's a little bit controversial is I'm not a big fan of social media. Uh, if I'm going to work on something, I'd rather work on something once and then reap the benefits in the long term. Okay. So my friends who do social media well, like Instagram or Facebook and whatnot, uh, my friend who does Instagram well posts seven times a day. My friend who does Facebook very well posts 21 times a day. And guess what happens when they stop posting? The traffic stops. I don't like that. Uh, so what I focus on is mainly Google properties, actually. So SEO and YouTube. I literally have posts that I wrote 10 years ago that still generate me traffic and leads today, kind of on autopilot. And then I have YouTube videos that I filmed like three years ago that still generate views and give me email subs. So I like to leverage my time in a better way. And that's kind of why I have shot away from social media over the years. That's that's a um, mature decision or a brave one because social media is the wave so many people are riding now. Um, but Steve, uh, you said a few minutes ago, and the audience is thinking, wait, wait, wait. One of your one of your goals one year was TikTok. That's social media. But I'm yeah. guessing that you just didn't post new stuff every day. You you created content that could be posted and repurposed. Or what did you do on TikTok? So TikTok is like the borderline. TikTok stuff will last maybe six months. So that's why I was willing to do it. And let me just talk about my process here. I produce one blog post. That blog post turns into a YouTube video. Like I massage the post to make it more concise for video. Then that video actually gets split up into multiple TikToks, right? And then from there, I post on YouTube, uh, YouTube shorts, as well as Instagram reels. So it's all just, that's another principle, repurposing what you got. Right. That makes a whole lot yeah. more sense. When I was doing much more so social media and I, I stopped at the end of uh, December 2022, because it is constant and it is a lot of work, um, I had somebody that was pulling stuff from my book, pulling things from a podcast where I was a guest and repurposing it all. But I still had to approve it all every month. And there were you know posts every single day. Um, as soon as it stopped, the traffic went down. You're, you're absolutely right. I, and I didn't write content that could be then repurposed and permanently up on YouTube and other channels. There's no permanence to it. It's all very temporary stuff. So I like that approach. It's a, it's a, it's a brave one because most people are, again, talking so much about social media and finding influencers to talk about their product and grow their revenues, which, you know, Hey, it, it works at, at a certain, at a certain level. But what you're talking about really is Steve Chu up there posting. Uh, it's you and your face and name on social media on a on a regular basis. Like your friends that do this, is it them that are on Facebook twenty one times a day or seven times a day, or is it you know are they repurposing content as well? They're repurposing also, but just even the act of posting that many times, it's kind of a burden. Um, you have to be involved in it because it's your personal brand, right? Yeah, hundred percent. You have to be because your voice is out there. And if, uh, if a VA screws it up and says something that makes you look like an idiot, people think you're an idiot. They're not going to blame the VA. No question about it. And I will say this, it's not about being brave. It's really about efficiency, right? If you know that you can't do it all, you got to pick and choose your platforms that you go for, right? And so for me, and this is just a personal decision, I prefer to get the most bang for my buck because I have limited time. If I, had, if I didn't have the kids and I had all this time in the world, I'd probably try to be everywhere. I, in fact, I am kind of everywhere still, but I just kind of emphasize on the platforms that that do really well. And I'll just add this, like blogging and YouTube also pay out really well. So my YouTube channel did 35,000 just on AdSense last month. And that's enough for me to live on, which means that my other seven figure businesses are just gravy. And that mentally just makes me sleep at night. Is that like sleeping at night? Sleeping no, at night is nice. <laughs> I, um, the audience yeah. has heard me bitch about this in the last few episodes. Uh, so you've got uh, 
Bumblebee Linens and so my wife could her job. Those are the two seven figure businesses that you're referencing. That's correct. Okay. Yes, that's correct. And you run both of them in 20 hours a week. Does your wife also work 20 hours a week? Yes, she does also. So just to be clear, my wife and I are partners on Bumblebee Linens. Okay. So she handles the operations and I handle the marketing for Bumblebee Linens. And then we kind of made this compromise. We're not trying to grow Bumblebee Linens more than like maybe low double digits every year. Because especially with e-commerce, when you grow that thing fast, very uncomfortable uh, because you actually have to fulfill products. You usually have to hire more staff. You get more inventory in. Uh, we used to fight all the time because I'd run a promotion and you know, one time sales went up 7X for sustain like that for a week. We fought every day. Yeah. So uh, I focus- She's out there pickpacking and shipping and blaming it on you. Well, everyone's in there pickpacking and shipping <laughs> actually. Because you either want, you have to make a decision. Do you need to hire the staff and sustain this? Or do you, you know, just- slow and steady growth. Let's talk the about the stuff. everyone because I've been seeing your um, social media posts about the book on Facebook and they're hilarious. You've got your kids in there <laughs> talking about, you know, them getting paid. And, uh, you know, you say that they are, I think in one of them, they're getting paid uh, by you paying them to go to college or you paying for their college. <laughs> yeah. Talk to me about the joy and fun of, of having your kids that get involved with the business. They understand what you're doing. You know, a, a lot of folks uh, hold back, you know, how how their business is going from their children. I don't. My kids know everything. Um, you seem to share an awful lot in educating your kids as entrepreneurs as, as, as you go along this journey. Is that right? We're educating them, but not because we're like shoving in their faces. Like, like they see what we're doing and they want to take part. And so uh, my son and daughter actually started their own online store, Print on Demand. It's called Kid in Charge. They started with their allowance money and they made a thousand bucks in a month when they launched that thing. And that's a lot of money for them. So, you know, we put it towards their college education. But uh, did you, did you, yeah, and, you, you did, oh, they made, okay, you didn't give them seed money. So you don't want a portion of it. It was their babysitting money. Okay. Just, just checking, right? Kid in, <laughs> kids in Charge. What's it called? Kidincharge.com. It's entrepreneurship t shirts for kids. So the process for that was they would, design something, I would send it off to get digitized. And then we put it on a shirt and then they would market it on Facebook by making videos once again. Awesome. So, Awesome. And yeah. they learned that from you and your wife. They did. Yes. So I helped them with that first design, but my daughter's new site, renab.com, selling her own jewelry is entirely hers from start to finish. I, you know, I've so got to put these bad. in the show notes and, and get spellings for these types of things. Rena B, how do you spell that? Uh, R-E-E-N-A-B-E-E. -E -E. She chose B because our store is Bumblebee Linen. So she yeah. chose renab.com. She's no dummy. Yeah. yeah, she's making the connection. She's going to hopefully tap into the Bumblebee Linen's audience and uh, have a quick boost in revenue, right? She's smart. Well, I'm excited about her new project, which she's going to start a little entrepreneurship class for teens, like a course. No kidding. No and kidding. Um, she's a little apprehensive about going live on video because I'm convincing her that, you know, she needs to go live to sell this. Otherwise, it'll be a little harder. So uh, it should be really good for her to practice like her broadcasting skills. Yeah. Well, I see you on the videos with her and it seems like she's a natural, so I'm sure it's going to go great. She is pretty good, but she's never done anything entirely impromptu for like 30 minutes or more. She's great in like short bursts. Mm. Well, we all are at first. And then you, you gain that experience and uh, you become the expert and can talk about it. Uh, whatever. Like a lot of people will say to me if they're coming on the podcast, you know, do I have a list of questions for them? I'm like, hell no. You're, you're the expert. We're just going to let it fly and you'll figure it out. I'm not going to ask you questions about mountain climbing if you're a deep sea diver you're the expert it's okay wing it you do that very well i'm sure you do that on your own podcast podcast as well right you don't have any practice the same questions. formula yeah no never never that'd be an awful yeah. experience all right so uh, let's go back to the the idea of the book this is on your bucket list um and you're doing it differently than i did i used um scribe media um and essentially paid for it and got the book published. 
you have been out there enough that I don't think you needed to do that, right? Tell, are you comfortable sharing uh, the absolutely yeah, yeah. The way this happened for um, you versus me? Yeah, so I wanted to go the traditionally published route. And uh, let me just go through a couple of reasons. So my, I've been doing this for a long time, writing blog posts, but my mom has never read anything. It was only after I told her, oh, I'm doing a traditionally published book by HarperCollins. She got all excited. She's like, oh, where did I get the book? I want to read it. I'm like, okay. So basically, you're all about like the credentials. I remember one time, like she didn't really take our handkerchief business seriously, which is Bumblebee Linens, until we got mentioned in Forbes. And then all of a sudden, she went nuts. So you're that was little, another you're, reason you're for me to You're just always go. that little boy to your mother. That's the reason for that. I am, you know, because we're, we're brought up, you know, in such a way that we don't get positive affirmation for the things that we do. Uh, maybe it's, it's a cultural thing. So, uh, no, yeah, my, it's, it's, look, look yeah. my mother's, it's a funny thing. My mother and father, neither one of them have ever read my book. My mother-in-law, on the other hand, has read it thoroughly and her brother has read it thoroughly and recommended it to friends. It's, they didn't grow up with me as a child, but my mother and father, it's, I'm just Joey to them, right? Little Joey, the fourth child in a family of four. Um, they're, they're not going to read my book ever. Um, so it's interesting. The, do, do, what about your in-laws? Have they ever read any of uh, the blog posts or articles on Bumblebee Linens? No, they have not, but they will read this traditionally published book now. It's the way it is, it's Harper funny. Collins, and and what does it take? Your your goal is to be a uh, Wall Street Journal bestselling author. Is that right? Is that That's the, correct. The yeah. for? And I think New York Times is too up in the air. Like I'll try, you know, but there's too many other factors in there. Yeah, New York Times so. is not just about numbers. There's a lot of other factors, right? right? So Wall Street Journal is about the numbers. So you've got to sell a certain amount of books in your category in a one week period. If I understand, is that, is that right? That's correct. That's All correct. Right. Walker didn't run you through the. Uh, oh no, he did. Numbers there. He I did. did. Okay. All right. You're just playing dumb. Got it. Yeah. Why don't Why don't Why don't you run me through the numbers so the audience can hear? Because they are entrepreneurs. They all have families, and they all should buy the book. And I want them to not wait. I want you to buy it right now, uh, by the end of this podcast. So, Steve, I want to help you. We want to help you, not only get to Wall Street Journal bestselling author, but mainly because. We need this book as entrepreneurs, right? I'm nearing, I'm at the latter stage of my entrepreneurial journey. I'm not done yet, but I'm at the latter stage. And if I had had it in 1997, um, I would have had an awfully long period of uh, health and focus and relaxation. My, my bur- I might've been burning more burners, right? Could I, bur- could I burn all four? Would I've had to turn any off if I read your book? Probably at some point. But your approach just makes more sense. I would have been more present for my family. Um, I would have paid myself first a long time ago. We've just done this in the last few years. And um, the idea of growing slow because of focus on family is so novel, right? Our egos just get in the way and we want to grow businesses as quickly as possible. Like I get excited. It, like I've said it. Ego wise, quiet light's grown 55% year over year since Mark and I became full partners in 2018. There you go, 55%. If we just grow 10% a year for the next decade, that's we're at that point where, you know, bursting at the seams is not all that fun. Let's grow slow, let's grow steady, let's continue to do it right. Let's keep our lives healthy, our families healthy, and our team healthy more than anything else. So all of your advice is, is ringing home to me. And, and hopefully with the audience as well. But the, the problem with books is you actually have to buy them and you have to read them. Too many people these days um, just want all the answers like that. It sounds like your book is something that people can keep referencing and put some actions into play over time and eventually be in a position like you are working 20 hours a week, running two seven-figure businesses and living off of very little of it. Um, but I'm ranting Let's now. Let's be clear, Joe. Let's be clear here. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have to grow slowly. Uh, because my wife quit her job because it's a digital business, has grown really fast. You just need systems in place. So if you can handle the growth, by all means, do it. Right? I hear you. I hear you. And I think you're right. Um, but let's get back to numbers. How many books does one need to sell in their category 
in order to become a Wall Street Journal bestseller? The audience would probably want some, some people in the audience are writing sure. books. What's the number? I would say five to th- 6,000 copies in a week. And it's, here's some tips uh, for your audience who are writing books. You mentioned before people don't like to read. So you're not actually selling the books, you're selling the bonuses. So that's why for my book, I've given away a three day workshop on e commerce as soon as you signed up. This is a literally three hours of video, uh, a two day course on how to make money with content for everything that I do, which is podcasting, blogging, and YouTube. And I'm also doing what I call a six week family first challenge, where I'm literally walking everyone through how to figure out what their next side hustle is and how to balance all this in real time. And that's going to take place after the book launches. Um, one thing that I'm doing in April is every single week, I'm putting out a new piece of content or a new workshop. And you have to buy the book to get that. If you buy it after the workshop, then you don't get access to that content. And so this is creating a sense of urgency for people to actually get the book. You're so much smarter than I am. That's the bottom line. Well, it's a lot Steve. more work, Joe. It's a lot more work, <laughs> you know, to do it this way. It is. It's so. but, but but you're helping more people, right? Because as I just said, people don't read books anymore. Um, and you're offering bonuses and tools that are gonna appeal to a variety of people and and the way they like to learn. Some people love learning by books, other want the book on tape, other want uh, you know, a course. Uh, others want all video. Um, it, there's so many ways that we we learn as human beings. It sounds like you're offering a wide variety of them so that it's going to appeal to a, a broader range of people. And then the book at the end of the day is something that they'll have physically and, and, and refer back to hopefully time and time again. But the, the bonuses are it's pretty smart. So how, how does it work when somebody wants to order something? What's the, are they paying just for yeah. the cost of the book? Where do they, what website do they go to in order to do it? Um, and then, you know, that kind of yeah. stuff. So if you want access to the bonuses, you go over to the family first entrepreneur, that's T H E F A M I L Y first entrepreneur.com. Hopefully you guys can all spell that. I keep misspelling it myself. Uh, all you gotta do is just pre-order the hardcover of the book at your favorite retailer. There's a form that you fill out where you upload a copy of your receipt. And then I will send you a login to a private membership site where all the content lives. So you can think of it like a course in a way. You get a login, you get access to all these videos and tutorials Okay. in addition to the book. Thefamilyfirstentrepreneur.com. Pre-order the hardcover of the book. Hardcover. Hardcover. It's got to be the hardcover. And then upload the receipt you'll have a digital receipt that you upload there's a form there's a form that yeah just take a snapshot it doesn't really matter yeah yeah okay and then you'll get all the bonuses for the uh, all mm-hmm. the bonuses that you just mentioned can you run through those again one more time yes you get a three-day workshop on e-commerce you get a two-day workshop on content which includes blogging podcasting and youtube and then i'm doing a six-week live challenge where I will be present with you guys on a Facebook group, doing live broadcasts, answering questions and that sort of thing to help you find your family first side hustle. Okay. One of the things I didn't do here, Steve, at the beginning of the podcast was have you tell the audience all of these things that you do, right? We've talked about Bumblebee Linens and, and Seller Summit briefly. I talked about it, but um, we, we haven't really clearly uh, educated the audience on what a badass you are in terms of e-commerce and content development and running two very successful businesses. Talk to me about the, th- the, the, the few things that you do. You've got a podcast. What's the name of the podcast? Podcast is called My Wife Quitter Job. Okay. And the blog is, the, is called My Wife Quitter. Yeah. Yeah. And what is, and the blog is mywifequitterjob.com, right? Dot com. And, yep, and w- what correct. is that business about? That business basically documents my journey in e-commerce, and it's become somewhat of like an encyclopedia of e-commerce, covering both Amazon and selling on your store. I also talk a little bit about philosophy, money philosophy, uh, wealth building, and that sort of thing on there as well. Okay. And that's been around for a long time, since 2000 and- 2009. Nine. Seven-figure business. Correct. Correct. Okay. And then Bumblebee Linens is a physical product e-commerce business. That's been around since 2008, I think you said your wife launched 2007 it? 2007 is when we started it. And you've yeah. been 
you quit your full-time job uh, to focus on that as well in 2015. You went to uh, Stanford University for engineering. You're no dummy, right? That's Stanford? correct. I actually love, yeah, Stanford University. I actually love being an engineer. Uh, it's funny. Uh, there's been times where I considered going back to work because there's a lot of things you can't really build unless you have a team in the tech space. But so you, don't like, you don't like employees, so you can't do that. I'm telling you right now, you're, you're not allowed to do that. I'm not allowed to do that? No. <laughs> okay, maybe I'll start my next tech company. How's that, Joe? Is that acceptable? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. Only if you outsource everything. That's the key, <laughs> <right>? <laughs> That's the key. Dude, you, you, you and I first met, I think, at ECF in, God, it was in California. I think it was the first one. Didn't we meet in Austin? No. Were you in Austin? No, not the first ECF. The first ECF I went to was, and ECF folks is e-commerce fuel. Uh, it's a great event, great mastermind group. Um, and the other one is Seller Summit. We didn't talk about that. You and Tony do oh, Seller yeah. Summit every year in May, right? That's correct. Uh, the reason, okay, let me just tell you the reason why I started that. I always wanted to be a keynote speaker and no one was asking me. So I started my own event. And <laughs> hey, I asked myself to be the keynote and I said, yes. Uh, I also hate large events. So I purposely made this one small and intimate. It's 200 people. And we, uh, we mastermind on the first day. We break up into groups of 10 to 12 people in, our, in a room. We cater in food and we just do it hot seat style, helping each other. Like that's the type of event I want. So that's why I created it. And we love going as a team. You know, I personally, we always have conflicts schedule wise. My son uh, runs track. Both of them ran track in high school. And I, as I said earlier, I don't miss those events. And um, so I've got certain people that go every year and they will fight tooth and nail to make sure that they get to go back. Right. We've got 14 advisors, you know, fighting over certain events that they want to go to. And those that, you know, originally went to seller summit will not let anyone else in. So they, they love it as well. Just because as you said, it's small groups of entrepreneurs that actually can have conversations and get to know each other. It's not a room full of 250 people uh, listening to one person speak for, you know, an hour and a half at a time, back to back, back to back, back to back. So it's a great event. So we've got Bumblebee Linens. We've got my wife quit her job. We've got my wife quit her job podcast. And we've got Seller the Summit. YouTube channel. We've got YouTube. Seller Summit. What's the YouTube yeah. channel? It is, it's through. It's my wife quit her job also. Yeah. Yeah. Could you do doing everything. Um, that literally just started making, I told you, it makes like 35,000 a month just on AdSense revenue. That just started like, that literally just started like a year ago. The the, the revenue part. Like it wasn't making money. Yeah. It so took what me is it? Three, what, are you, what are you doing yeah. on it though? Is it, are you just, you're not reading your blog posts? You're, is it, is it you? Is it your face? It's me. It's my face. I take a blog post. I repurpose it and make it concise for video. I also do my own, you know, from scratch videos also. And I put them out on YouTube and they do pretty well. Are you doing like, when you say you, are you sitting in front of the camera like you are now? And you're producing the video. Are you editing the video? And all I'm of not that? editing it anymore. I edited the stuff. first couple of videos. And then what I did is I recorded a video of me editing it. And then I found someone to do it. Because uh, editing just takes a tremendous amount of time. Um, I always do things in what I feel like is an efficient way. So literally when I record, just a talking head, me in front of my bookcase. And then I have the editor add in like different camera, ang not camera angles, but different zoom points, annotations, and B-roll. That's all it is. That's it. How long are the videos on YouTube? Is there a special They're 10 to there? 15 minutes. Well, no, there's no real formula in terms of length. Although YouTube wants people to stay on and watch longer. So I always do a minimum of 10 minutes. That's just me. Um, more importantly, if anyone listening wants to do a YouTube channel, I would say the number one piece of advice I have is have a setup where filming videos is frictionless. Uh, for the longest time, I couldn't get started because it would take me 20 minutes to set up the lights and everything. Now I just have one button that I just hit and I just start recording. And I think getting a teleprompter is also key. So you mentioned reading off of something. Um, I just have bullet points and then just kind of ad lib it. Just keep the, keep the camera running. It takes me maybe 20, 25 minutes to film a video. I chuck it over to the editor. It's that doesn't take that much time at all. Do you, like I've done these before. And when I, <laughs> When I'm a little less uh, picky or when I let my ego go, I can get it done and get it done well with me in my natural, 
you know, persona without, you know, uh, it being perfect. I'm a, it's better when it's not perfect, right? When there's flubs and flaws. I don't, in fact, with this podcast, I, I can't remember the last time we edited anything. If I've said something stupid, it's because I'm human and we don't edit it out. Um, how you, I love the frictionless idea. I think it's brilliant because I think it's so, so important because you just can't get started if you try to make it perfect. If you think it, you know, you have to buy all this equipment and everything and get your lighting perfect and your background perfect, you're never really going to get started. Um, what do you do when you're actually shooting if you, you know, if it's not absolutely perfect? How, how, how flexible are you with, you know, letting your true human side come out? Uh, I think with YouTube, it's a little different because you need people to keep watching it. I think all of that stuff can be handled in post, right? You screw up. What I do is I just repeat the line that I just said again mm -hmm. and continue on. And it, anything can be edited. That's the beauty of video. And I always try to cut things pretty tightly so that it just flows. Sometimes it might be a little jerky, but that's fine because that keeps someone's attention. So I wouldn't leave my mistakes in there unless I was doing outtakes. On podcasts, that's perfectly fine. I think on YouTube... I don't know. It just depends, actually. Do you, uh, and we're just going to go on and on here. I'm just going to keep ask, asking you questions. Hopefully you don't hey, have go somewhere for it. to go. Do you, um, in any of your courses and any of your, your educational stuff, do you teach people how to do uh, YouTube uh, do. Uh, videos? You do? Yeah. I run uh, two training classes. One covers e-commerce. That's over at ProfitableOnlineStore.com. And the one that covers blogging, YouTube, and podcasting is called ProfitableAudience.com. Okay. I thought we had three things that you did in 20 hours a week. Now you've got two additional things or are those like subsets of, you know, some of my wife. I job? lump all those under my wife quit her job, to be honest with you. Okay. Yeah. The courses. Yeah. Okay. How, uh, yeah. All right. <laughs> well, I can tell you how I manage those really easily. So um, I don't, I, I just give one live session a week and I put them into a video repository after I've edited them. So the library of videos just grows over time. I've been running profitable online stores since 2011. And just imagine putting out one lesson a week for however many years, over a decade, really good library now. And people Huge. love the live instruction. So it's kind of low energy. I, I just do that Wednesday mornings. Uh, when you do live instruction, is it, is, uh, are people asking questions? Are they joining? Yes. Mm -hmm. There's really? a live chat. Yeah. Very cool. And I, it's when you started, because... how many people showed up? You ever have any uh, you know, I, days or weeks when yeah, it's yeah. Like, you know one person? I started the class without any content, and then I sold thirty-five seats with no content, and I was like, okay, dang, I got to actually make this course now. So there's never really one person there because I started out with thirty-five seats, and I didn't have any content, so they were forced to actually go to that class from the start. Okay, so you created you you, you sold the content you sold the seats first and then you built the course what was the Correct. what were the live sessions about it was just you know certain points in the course that you you went over live is that how it worked well when i first started it i started from the beginning e-commerce from scratch right and it was pretty sequential these days i have people joining at all different times so i have them watch certain things and in the live sessions i give a lesson based on what i'm working on right now because mm. there's always new stuff in e-com and I just yeah. answer questions about anything. It could be any topic or whatever during the Q&A session. Very cool. Yeah. You and I have not spent enough time together. We're, we're always running in different directions and I never get to sell or summit. Even if I got to sell or summit, you'd be too busy running it. So I wouldn't be able to spend any time with you. And it's a damn shame I didn't get to ECF this year. I'm going to try to get there next year and see if we can spend more time. Because I mean, there's a wealth of information. For those in the audience, um, check out all the URLs with, that we've shared. Please, please, please. Um, do yourself a favor and go to the familyfirstentrepreneur.com, buy the hardcover book, upload the receipt and get all these three bonuses that Steve is talking about. He knows what he is talking about. He lives the family first entrepreneur life first. Um, and as a fellow entrepreneur that's been doing this for a very long time, right? 1997, that's 26 years. It'll be 26 years in September uh, that I've been self-employed. It, it's, it's awesome. It's exciting. It's brutal. Um, I love it and I hate it. And it's painful and joyful and very fulfilling all at the same time. Um, but to level all of that out, right? I just talked about ups, downs, ups, downs, ups, downs. To level it all out with all these things that you're talking about 
in uh, your book, Steve, I think is uh, a resource that so many people could use. I know I could have used it back in 1997 and beyond. So thank you for writing it. I know how difficult it is to write a book and to write it well. And uh, I love your approach of giving out free bonuses to everybody. Look, let's everybody that's listening to the audience, uh, to the to the to this podcast, let's help Steve um, hit the Wall Street Journal bestseller list. Not just for Steve, but for all of the other entrepreneurs out there that should be buying this book and getting these free bonuses because it's necessary to live a healthy. Uh, family first life as an entrepreneur. We'll all be happier in the long run, not with how much money we have, but with our experiences, memories that we've we've had with our family along the way. So, Mr. Chu. I'll put it a different way, Joe. I would say help yourself because I guarantee you that you will get 20X your value from the bonuses in addition to the book. I guarantee it. It's just the way I operate, over deliver. Dude, I think you're, I think you're, you're shooting low. Twenty x, twenty x the uh, price of the book. Uh, it's probably two hundred x. You're, you're much better. Than that. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Steve, thanks, thanks for coming on the podcast, man. Congratulations on the book. Real excited. Hopefully, uh, everybody's going to go out and uh, and buy it, and uh, you're going to do well. I'm sure. Thanks so much for your time. Thank you so much. Thank you.